We're preaching a sermon series called Indomitable Faith. We want to be strong in our faith. We want to be bold in our faith. And the book of 2 Corinthians helps us to do that. The first several chapters of 2 Corinthians sound somewhat defensive as Paul defends his ministry, defends his past behavior to the church. And it's very personal in that, in that respect. And we're kind of in that part of the book right now. But Paul is not just defending himself for the sake of defending himself. Ultimately, he's defending the gospel and the content of the Christian faith. And we're going to talk about the subject of forgiveness then today in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is where we're going to go, verses 5 to 11. Did you know that you can lose while thinking you won. It's not like that on the ice rink, the basketball court, the tennis court. You know who won, you know who lost based upon the score, the tally of points. But in life, in relationships, it's possible to lose while thinking that you won. This is what happens when you refuse to forgive others of sins that have been committed against you. And this passage that we're going to look at today specifically addresses sins that have been committed against believers, from one believer to another believer, in the church. Notably from some antagonist in the Corinthian church that had committed grievous sins against Paul and his leadership and his authority and his ministry. And Paul is reminiscing on this and teaching the church and reflecting upon this. And one of the truths that comes out loud and clear is that you can think you're winning by not forgiving, but you actually lose. You see, forgiveness loser is not just the offender. But if you have unforgiveness in your life, you as the offended one can very quickly become a loser as well. This might sound ironic or contrary to human experience, but as you think about it, you'll discover that it's absolutely true. Learning to forgive those that have offended us in the church is a means of defeating our enemy, Satan. The opposite is then also true. If we choose not to forgive, to hold grudges, to remain bitter, you might think, well, I'm the innocent party. I, I'm the one that has been offended. That person is the one that has sinned against me. But this passage teaches us that when you're sinned against, you can actually contribute to the kingdom of darkness by not forgiving the person that has sinned against you. Imagine that. They have the precipitating sin. They're the ones that start the sinful process. They sin against you. But you can actually sin back by choosing not to forgive the person that sinned against you. By allowing the devil a foothold in your life and in your church. In this context, Paul was mistreated. We already know that because we studied chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. Paul had written at least four letters to the Corinthian church. We know that because in 1 Corinthians, he mentions a letter that he wrote before. In 2 Corinthians, he mentions a painful letter which would have been written between 1 and 2 Corinthians. And that painful letter was a letter of rebuke against this church. And up till now, we're sort of left with the impression that it's the church as a whole. But as Paul moves forward in his discussion, we discover that it was really a particular individual, an antagonist, that had fanned the flame of division, that had accused Paul of sin. And the church's response to this individual is what Paul wanted to address. So we're going to wrestle with this question. Who loses if we fail to forgive? And the Bible teaches us, as I've already stated, that if you refuse forgiveness, you lose and the you refers both to you as the offended party, but it also refers collectively in the plural to the whole church. The church also loses when you choose not to forgive someone who sinned against you. And we're going to see why that is true. Four things to consider in the text. Let's start off with verse 5. 
verse 5 essentially teaches us, this is kind of, a lot of these things that Paul is going to teach are like mindsets that are healthy for us to adopt. Things we need to consider and lock into our thinking patterns as we process offenses that have been committed against us. And here's the first truth that I think this passage is teaching us that helps us to forgive. Here it is. It's less personal than you think. It's less personal than you think. Look at verse five. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me. Now, just pause there for a moment. Why would Paul say that when clearly this antagonist had sinned directly against him? Remember, Paul changed his itinerary, his travel patterns. And so this individual started accusing Paul of being a liar. Oh, he said he was going to come, but he didn't come. He's a liar. So why would we believe anything else he said? And that person, best as we can tell, was throwing around these accusations against Paul because he was upset with Paul's painful letter where Paul had to con confront the church about other things. People that have been confronted either repent or they get vicious. And this person got vicious with Paul, started accusing him. And because he was really had no substance, substantive reason to accuse Paul, he got down in the mud. He's like, well, well what about his travel plans? He picks this minor insignificant issue. Paul had changed his mind for various reasons. Circumstances changed about where he was going to travel. And he started accusing Paul, frankly, on some stupid little petty issue. So Paul was offended. Track with me. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me. What are you talking about, Paul? Listen to Paul's mindset. But in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. How so? How is it that an offense directed from the antagonist to Paul somehow could be understood to have caused pain to the whole church. Again, Paul's pain was caused by the church, but notably by a ringleader, an antagonist among them. But here, here is what Paul is teaching the church. When wrongdoers attack someone, when wrongdoers falsely accuse a leader of sin, when people lash out against one another in the church, in actual fact, they are sinning against the body of Christ. Because their attacks against the people of God or the people that God has put in place to lead his church weaken the church. It weakens the church in terms of its testimony. If unbelievers start to find out, and how many stories could we tell about that? where the world starts to hear about the church's deficits and problems and fuels the accusations of, yeah, all Christians are just hypocrites. They're a bunch of losers. They, they're a bunch of liars. They're a bunch of cheats. It doesn't bless our testimony. It distracts us from ministry. You know, how, how many times have we dealt with conflict in our church and you're, you're trying to counsel people and you're trying to lead people to Christ you're trying to do the work of the ministry in the community, but now you got to spend 10, 15, 20, 25, 40, 50, 100 hours of your time over the course of weeks or months trying to put out some little fire on the side as a huge distraction because someone's acting up. It might just be between two people, but others have to get involved and leaders have to take time out of their schedules and drive to the church for meetings and elders have to stay up till 11, 12 o'clock, not uncommon, in meetings talking about issues. And it becomes a huge distraction from the work of the ministry. Evangelism suffers. There's a sense of peace that eludes the church. You know, People know if there's conflict in the church, something's not right. It's not as joyful. It's not as peaceable. Paul helps the church to understand this, that when one believer offends and sins against another believer, it's not just between the two, unless it's dealt with right away. But it often becomes a community issue, a massive distraction. And the mature believer then, who's been attacked, doesn't just look at offense as an offense to him or her, but they understand, okay, this person's behavior 
while it's a sin against me, is actually a sin against the body of Christ. Now, this is helpful because it depersonalizes the situation on one hand. But what it also does is it kind of elevates the significance of the sin because we begin to realize, okay, this, this is not a minor issue. It might be a minor issue between this person and myself, but this has the potential to derail the church as it is on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, brothers and sisters, is why we each have to choose to do the best job we can of dealing quickly and efficiently and clearly and urgently with sinful behavior that may be levied against us. Reminding the person, yeah, I know you've offended me, but we need to deal with this because this has the potential to mushroom into something really bad and affect the whole community of faith. So that's truth number one, which I think is a helpful reminder. Truth number two, and this is an uh, indication, I think, of Paul's pastoral heart, where he, he loved the people. He was able to, in a sense, disconnect himself from the pain he was feeling, kind of put that on the side for a moment, and consider the pain in, believe it or not, the offending person's life. So truth number two is that the offender often suffers more than you know. Verse 6, 7, and 8 teach us this. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. We don't know the specifics of what was taking place in this person's life. But best as we can tell, if you read between the lines a little bit, it would appear that the antagonist was beginning to or had become well aware of his sinful behavior. Others had called him out on it. He had been, in a sense, ostracized, maybe disfellowship, maybe pushed to the side. He was being punished. And the pain of punishment from the majority who were otherwise acting righteously were wearing him down and discouraging him beyond his capacity. Paul obviously caught on to this. And so while he could have said, hey guys, give him another kick. Slap him around a little more. Make him pay for what he did. Paul's concern is that this antagonist would be restored to full fellowship in the church. This is symptomatic of great spiritual maturity, brothers and sisters. When we can find ourselves at a place in our spiritual journey where our heart actually is enlarged for the person that has deeply hurt us and hurt the church. This is symptomatic of great spiritual maturity. We do know that anyone that's truly saved, that's among God's people, who sins against God's people, will not be blessed by their antics. If you're a sinful person, life doesn't get better. If you're divisive, you're rebellious, you're gossipy, you're a slanderer, whatever it might be, your life is not filled with joy and peace and love. You know that in your spirit. When we sin against other people, as much as we may try to self-justify or convince ourselves that we're in the right, like life just isn't right. We know, we know that something is wrong. People that attack others, and you, you, you meet people like this, even, even among God's people who are spiritually immature. They, they attack other people. They're, they're gossipy. They're slanderous. They, they rebel against authority. You get into their lives, you realize there's there's a lot of anger there. There's a lot of bitterness there. There's a lot of joylessness, unhappiness, guilt, shame, especially when they're busted and the rest of the body of Christ chooses not to support their sinful behavior. And they feel maybe foolish and pushed aside 
And again, the human temptation is if a dog bites you, you give it a kick. And then maybe you give it another one just to kind of put it in its place. And then maybe you give it another one yet. But that's not a Christian response. Of course, poor behavior will never be tolerated by any healthy church. Never be tolerated. Only sick churches will allow unfounded accusations and division and attacks on its leaders and slander to go unnoticed. Only sick churches will allow that, but healthy churches will deal with it. And before long, offending parties will experience relational breakdown. They'll be sidelined. People will be like, yeah, I don't really want to go out with you for coffee. I don't, I don't really want to be friendly to you in the foyer. I don't want to pretend like things are okay. You're sinning against God's people. I, I know about your behavior. But at the same time, as we confront and as we call out people for inappropriate behavior, we should feel bad about it. We shouldn't do it with joy and enthusiasm. We should feel bad about it. On a certain level, we should always feel sorry for divisive people. And our goal when we confront is always what? Starts with an R. Restoration. That's always the goal of confrontation. It's always the goal. Did you say revenge? No, I said restoration. It's always restoration. We want the best for the other. And, and yeah, we might have to get tough, tighten the screws, so to speak. Might have to go back to the person a few times. Be forceful. But our goal is ultimately restoration. And those of you who've been Christians for a while, you know what the blessing of this is like in your own life because we've all been the person on the receiving end of rightful confrontation. And it never feels good. But in our spirit, we're like, this, I need this. I, I, yeah, you're right. And once reconciliation has happened and restoration has taken place, we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that happened. Thankful that happened. So in the, in the midst of the offense, let's remember that the offender is not flourishing in sin and there needs to be plenty of opportunity for us to reaffirm our love for the antagonists in our lives. Look at verse 8. So I beg you. That's a sense of urgency and it's, it's very, that's very personal language. I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Those of you that are parents, just use the parenting analogy. You know, sometimes your, your child will do something that is way, way over the line. And you have to come down like a ton of bricks. And if they push back and bristle, you, 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 tight, you tighten up the screws. You, you, you keep the pressure on. But, but as soon as they, they break and buckle, you don't say, ha, 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 ha. You know, I won, you lost, little loser. No. You, you embrace the child. You affirm the child. You say, yeah, I want to let you know. I know this has been a hard, hard time, but I love you. And I want you to do well. And I don't want you to wallow in your shame and in your guilt. Same, same in the body of Christ. Same principle that we need to apply. Here's the third truth. The stakes are higher than you realize. Verse 9 teaches us, For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. He's probably referring back to the painful letter that he'd written them. And again, there might have been some lingering questions in the minds of the church. Does our apostle really love us? What was his purpose? What was his motivation in confronting us? What did he have in mind here? He tells them, for this is why I wrote, that I might test you. Why do you test someone? You test someone for the express purpose of looking for improvement. Why does your teacher give you a test? They want to measure whether you're learning. And the fact that you know a test is coming also sort of 
ups the ante. It's like, okay, I, I got to prepare for this. I got to up my game. I, I got to test tomorrow. I got to test on Monday. We test people in order to improve people. Bad teachers test people in order to make them feel bad about themselves. And maybe there's a few bad teachers out there that do that. It's like maybe, you know, in school, every once in a while you have this, you know, gleefully wicked teacher that just always seemed to gloat when you failed. But the good teacher wants what's best for you. The good teacher wants you to get an A. The good teacher wants you to score 100%. They don't want you to settle for a 70 or an 80 or even a 99. They want you to, to succeed. And Paul wanted this church to succeed as well. So he tells them, hey, I wrote you that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. The way we handle divisive people proves whether or not we are obedient to the word of God. Paul had written them a painful letter to confront them about confronting this antagonist. And he teaches them here that when someone sins against us, both our confrontation, listen to this, both our confrontation and our subsequent forgiveness prove the authenticity of our faith. It proves whether we are obedient or not. Who's testing this church? I'm going to call you out on some stuff. You're allowing this guy to run haywire in the church. I'm testing you. Why am I doing this? Well, I want to deal with the immediate issue, but I also want to test to see if you're going to be obedient or not. I think it was John Calvin that said, one of the marks of a true or pure church is church discipline. Now, I can tell you, church discipline, if you're anything like me, and I think most of you are in this respect, church discipline is like the very last thing you really want to do. It's like you want, you want the laughter, you want the handshakes, you want the hugs, you want the meaningful conversation, you want the time of prayer. Who of us gets up in the morning and says, you know, I'd really like to, I'd like to go confront somebody today. I'd like to call them out on some sinful behavior, you know, wringing your hand. We don't, we don't like that. But we know that if we don't do that hard work, the church suffers. The church suffers. Paul had to confront this church, not just for the sake of confronting them, but he uses it as a means of proving the authenticity of their faith. Will they actually obey what had been spoken to them by their spiritual leaders, the apostolic figures, or would they push it aside? And apparently, to fail at either is to fail as a believer. To fail either in confrontation or to fail in forgiveness is to fail as a believer. What is fascinating about all of this, and I kind of alluded to this earlier on in my introduction, is that when we are sinned against, we can actually sin back by not responding as we should. Think about that. When we're sinned against, we can actually sin back by not responding as we should. Or when we're sinned back or sinned against, we can demonstrate our obedience through either confrontation and or forgiveness. So you, when you're sinned against, you have to respond. Our, our natural inclination is, I'm just going to ignore it. Now, obviously you can't possibly deal with every single microscopic sin that's ever been committed against you. It's not like, you know, someone gave me a dirty look in the foyer. Okay, church discipline meeting. No. You can't deal with every microscopic offense because as broken, sinful people, we're always going to, on some level, sin against others. But when we sin in big ways, in ways that actually have the potential to destroy relationship or bring disrepute to the church, or that is in clear disobedience to God's word, we, we, we are in a position where we have to choose. Am I going to confront and forgive? Or am I going to try to ignore it? Not a good thing. And by the way, we also need to consider our witness to the world. You know, the world's watching us. It's watching us. 
And this has been something that has taken place since obviously the founding of the church. Unbelievers are watching God's people. John Stott, many years ago, in a book called The Contemporary Christian, wrote this. Not long before she died in 1988, in a moment of surprising candor on television. Marganita Lasky, one of our best known secular humanists, by the way, she was an absolute avowed atheist from Jewish descent, but a total atheist and novelist said, this is what she said. What I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. The world watches. They may not surrender, bow the knee to Christ. But there is something powerful about seeing people that claim the name of Christ expressing forgiveness. I remember many years ago when the Amish community, there was that big shootout. The killer went in and shot all these young schoolgirls in the Amish schoolhouse in Pennsylvania, I believe it was. And like immediately, like within hours, I think it was, maybe even minutes. I don't know exactly, but it was really short. You had leaders within that community going on television saying, we want to offer our, our, our forgiveness to the person that has killed our little girls. And, it, and, and I, I think there was actually almost a certain measure of anger. Why would you forgive this person so quickly? Like, how dare you? This is the call of Christ upon his people. It doesn't mean we excuse it. doesn't mean we endorse it. doesn't mean we overlook it. But we refuse. We refuse to allow sin to be added to sin, evil to be added to evil by allowing the root of bitterness to take root in our lives. Hatred. We choose to forgive those that have offended us. Forgiveness then is a test and display of either our maturity or our immaturity. Fourth, the enemy is sneakier than you might be aware. This is very much a spiritual battle. When offenses take place between believers, there's a spiritual dynamic to all of this. In verses 10 and 11, the Bible instruct us, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. And then this is the reason why. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul understood, like much like an army, imagine... A bunch of soldiers, they're out on the battlefield and they're fighting against their enemy and then night falls and they retire to their camp. And maybe those soldiers don't always get along. Hey, you, you didn't leave me enough mashed potatoes. I'm hungry. Who, who took my socks? Why, why are you treating me that way? And maybe there's some skirmishes that take place among these soldiers that are otherwise on the same team. But they understand that if they don't deal with those issues, it's going to affect their unified efforts to do battle against the true enemy. But what Satan wants to do is he wants to divide and conquer his church, the church of Jesus Christ, they should say. He wants to divide and conquer the church, the army of God, so that we become less and less effective when we engage the true enemy enemy of our souls, the enemy of godlessness, of worldliness. And this is, and again, I don't have a great solution for all of you, but this is probably the thing that grieves my heart the most about the current climate of our culture is how divisive this virus has been among God's people. I don't know who it is. I'm not angry. I'm sad for you. But a few weeks ago, someone in our church anonymously contacted the health unit to rat us out. Shame on you for your behavior. Shame on you 
for not following the direction of your elders. Shame on you for hiding behind an anonymous email. By the way, you didn't win. The health unit's on our side. We're in a spiritual battle, church. This isn't just about how many lives are going to be taken by a virus. This is a battle for unity within the church. This is a battle for the gospel. This is a battle for souls. And while on a certain level we can agree to disagree, and I've gone on record as saying this, we can agree to disagree on many things and not shame each other for differences of opinion about how much hand sanitizer we should wear, the efficacy of masks. When you call the world to settle disputes in the church, you cross the line. And the devil wants to use these kinds of behaviors to discourage me, to discourage our leaders, to divide our church, to get people thinking, oh, who's on my side? Who's not on my side? What should I say? Should I live my life on edge all the time, wondering what people think? What kind of joy is there in that? Where's the win in that? There's no win. When that happens, we've been outwitted by, the, by, by our enemy, Satan himself. But the Bible says that the insightful person is not ignorant of his designs. He's not ignorant of his designs. He knows or she knows how the devil works to discourage, to distract, to create bitterness and angry, anger, to encourage people to give up and to quit on the mission that God has called us to. This passage assumes a measure of regret in the person who has committed these sins against Paul, but sometimes there is no regret. And so when it comes to forgiveness, we are usually confronted with two or presented with two scenarios. Number one, we're sinned against, the person doesn't repent, and we forgive, but we don't necessarily restore the relationship yet. Hear me on that? The relationship is not to be restored unless the forgiveness that is extended is also met with repentance. But hopefully more often than not, when we're sinned against and the person does repent, we forgive and we restore a measure of relational peace. Maybe if the offense is such, so heinous, so damaging, the fullness of the relationship cannot be restored as in the case of, let's say, sexual abuse. But there is a relational peace to one degree or another that is restored to God's people. And when we're offended, Yes, it hurts, but we need to understand the primary loss is to the mission of the church, which, personal offenses aside, the mission of the church, we must guard at all costs. We are the body of Christ, not the health unit. We're the body of Christ, not the provincial government. We're the body of Christ, not the federal government. We're the body of Christ, not the United Nations. We're the body of Christ, and if the body of Christ is not healthy and laser focused and committed to the task that God has commissioned it to. Who's going to fill in the gaps? Who's going to proclaim the gospel? Who's going to restore the marriages? Nobody. This is why at all costs, we must guard the unity of God's people. A few things for you to consider as we have read and studied this passage. Number one, are you a divisive person or a unifying person? Are you a divisive person or a unifying person? Just think about that. If you're not sure, ask around, pray about it. Ask for the Lord to give you clarity on this question. Secondly, do you tend to reject spiritual leadership? I've said this before. 
It's always more than mildly awkward for preachers to require the church to follow spiritual leadership because it can seem self-serving. Who cares? You need to get over it if you're going to preach the gospel. Because it's biblical, it's in the Bible, and I'm a spiritual leader, and I will not allow anyone to trample on my office. Not for my own personal benefit, because I don't need to do this to feel good about myself. But for other pastors, other elders, the sake of the church, the next generation of pastors, the generation that comes after that, shame on me if I allow someone to trample my spiritual office and pass on to the next generation some weak view of Christian leadership. Do you tend to reject spiritual leadership? If you are a spiritual leader, do you require proper, biblical, within the boundaries, submission to your leadership? You should. And you shouldn't apologize for it. Because creatures don't apologize to other creatures for what the Creator has said. Third, have you hurt others by speaking ill of them? Maybe to their face, maybe behind their back, maybe accusing them of things that are false. I've experienced that a few times. I know many of you have as well, where people literally concoct accusations against you. Maybe in their own headspace, somehow they think it's true. But some of them are so outlandish, it's like, how could anyone possibly believe that? Don't be that kind of person. If you are that kind of person, you have allowed Satan to outwit you. And you have lost. You might think you're winning, but you're actually losing. We are called to be agents of the king, not agents of the enemy, not turncoats, not traitors, but agents of the king. And of course, there might be a temptation at times to reduce sinful conflict among God's people down to all personality dis- differences or cultural differences. And that's true. Those things can play a role. Those of us that are men know that we don't always understand women. And those of you that are women know that you don't always understand men. And there can be certain conflicts that arise just because you're not the other. And in the same way, there can be a lack of understanding about personality differences or certain perspectives. We understand that. But at the same time, more often than not, it's just flat out sin. It's gossip, it's slander, it's covetousness, it's lies. It's false doctrine. And these are the things God has called his church to relentlessly and without apology address so that the king might be exalted among his people and the message of the kingdom might be spread from sea to shining sea and across our planet to the honor and glory of God. We've been through a lot as a church, but God has blessed us abundantly. Let's continue to make sure we do a really good job confronting where necessary, forgiving when required, so that God might shine brightly through the ministry of this local church for decades to come to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ.